baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. FSL.Church If you'd stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, I want to read John chapter 1 and verse 1, and then I'll skip down and read a few of the verses there in chapter 1. But John 1 and 1, you ought to be able to quote it if you've been around the Bible any time at all. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Amen. How many believe that? Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, and of his fullness have we, have all we received and grace for grace. And 18, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now the word declare there doesn't mean it's an audible deal. It's just something that's vocal. But it literally means that he's manifested him. He has revealed him. And so <clears throat> I want to talk to you today about this. Um, well, uh, Moses asked this question, and I think that this is my title here today. Show us thy glory. Show us thy glory. Amen. We sang about glory here just a few minutes ago, but let's talk about it. You want to talk about it a little bit? What do we really mean when we ask God to show us his glory? Amen. Father, I love you. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you for this time with the people of God. I pray that you minister to all of us through your word today. I take authority in this service in the name of Jesus. I pray that your word would go forth with clarity, wisdom, love, and power. I ask it in the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody back in mask. Amen. Is tomorrow the 15th? According to the governor, we won't have to wear a mask anymore tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> well, praise God. Uh, I think my new favorite Bible word is Damascus. Damascus, amen. And uh, I just preached the South Carolina camp. Of course, in South Carolina, there's no mask mandates. And, and uh, so anyway, so I get back to California and here we are, amen. Uh, when, when Moses and them made that statement, show us thy glory, I... Uh, <clears throat> I, I started out today by talking about the uh, presence of God. You were singing about the presence of God. And what I want you to know here today, and I want to kind of just open with this, it is <clears throat> there is a distinct difference between the presence of God and the glory of God. I told you a while ago that God's address is praise. And um, some of you may not like what I'm about to say, but you can be a drunk in a bar and get to talking about Jesus and you might sense his presence. And uh, I know my uncle Martin was um, kind of raised, he was older once my grandma and grandpa got into church, but his wife uh, was saved and he was saved just months before his death but um, he'd get down this little it's called the Long Branch Bar 
And he'd get down there and he'd get drunk and he'd go to preaching. And he'd be telling everybody in there they need to repent. And of course they would tell him we didn't come here to hear preaching. And then it ended up in a fight. And I know because one time I had to go with my dad down there to get my Uncle Martin. And uh, of course he was cursing everybody and then telling them they just didn't want to hear anything about Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, you can, you can get to singing about him, talking about him. It's kind of like, you know, uh, I've always said that about the devil. You can get to talking enough about the devil, something will show up. And the thing is, is we can come to the house of God and we can praise him and, and we can begin to worship him and we can sense the presence of God. But I'm not just interested in feeling the presence of God and not seeing the glory of God. Are you with me here? Uh, there's a distinct difference. Now, we could go through all kinds of things and try to define glory. And, of course, you know, nowadays you can Google anything. And, of course, everything you read on Google is validated. <laughs> it's, it's been fact-checked. Amen. And uh, you can find all sorts of stuff about the glory of God. But I think the best way to do it is to let the Scripture interpret the Scripture. What does the Bible teach us about the glory of God? And so I've looked at it. Some of the definitions and some of the things that are given to us, of course, is one of them is the glory of God or glory is intrinsic wealth. Paul mentions about uh, these light afflictions work within us a far weightier glory. And so you have to understand that when it comes to the glory of God, when it comes to glory, it has to be manifested and it has to be real, revealed. Um, again, it's not just something that you sense, but it's something that becomes tangible or it's uh, evident to the eye. There's weight to it, uh, intrinsic wealth. When Jesus concludes by giving them the Lord's Prayer, he concludes it by saying, for thine is the kingdom, the glory, and the power forever. The glory of a kingdom was the benevolence of the king and it was revealed through the prosperity of the people, the prosperity of that nation. So when you've seen the glory of a kingdom, you've seen its people, you've seen how that they were faring, you've seen uh, the blessing and the favor of the king upon them. That was dealing with glory. That's why when Jesus goes to the top of the mountain and he's being tempted, and the Bible says that he calls all the kingdoms and its glory, its pomp, its splendor, it passes there and he sees it. So when you start talking about glory, then you have to realize that John and his writings dealing, of course, with some of the Greek philosophies and Gnosticism and some of the teachings of those, he would deal with the fact that, uh, you know, in the beginning, so some of the other gospel writers go back to, who is it, to David and others, but John goes back to, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Several years ago, I've seen this, and I've, I've said this, it almost feels like a million years, but the fact is, or a million times, the fact is, is that God does not have the last word. God is the last word. And the word is eternal. Matter of fact, when Jesus says a little later in John, I'll go back and share the glory that I had with you from the beginning then what is the beginning? Well, John tells you what the beginning is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what Jesus is saying is, he's not going back and sharing the glory, the second person of the Trinity with the first person of the Trinity, but what he's saying is, is that I began in the beginning as the Word, and I am the Word made flesh. And when John sees him coming in the book of Revelation, he says that he has on that white horse, 
He has a vesture dipped in blood and he has a name called, which is the word of God. So Jesus is proclaiming that in the beginning was the word. I am the word made flesh. And when this flesh has been dealt with, I will go back to the glory of what was in the beginning. I will go back. And when this is as far as we're, con- I'm, I'm giving too much stuff. And I can tell right now, some of you are looking at me like, where in the world are you going here? But uh, we're, sonship is over. And now the revelation that he uh, is the word of God. But John picks it up and says that in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Now, we know that there for the Greek for word is logos. And logos just simply means thought or expression of thought. So you could say that in the beginning was the thought of God. And uh, so now you have a thought. Well, if you have a thought, then you have to have a thinker. And so you could actually kind of get into this, this little word play that in the beginning was the thinker and the thinker had a thought. And that's kind of how John 1 and 1 would kind of uh, be described. And that's as far as the Gnostics and that's as far as the Greeks would go. That everything was logos, meaning, uh, example that I would give is, is you're not really sitting in this building today. You are nothing more but logos. You are just a thought of some God somewhere. Some God is thinking all of this, and so you're not really real, and uh, everything is more realistic, but you're not real. And that's the way that they would look at it. Now, John understood the danger of that teaching, and that teaching was creeping into the church. And so that's why in his epistle he writes to us and says, this is he that came by word, or this is he that came by blood and water. That's not talking about the church, that's talking about Jesus Christ. And the word, the spirit, the blood, and the water agree in one. And so what he's trying to deal with is, is that Jesus Christ was not just Logos. He wasn't just a thought, but he was a man. It was real. It was tangible. It was blood and water, which is the components of humanity. So he's trying to prove that. Now, in his, in his gospel, he pins these words that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, in verse 14, he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, verse 16, Of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. The word grace there literally means, it's the Greek word charism. It is uh, also found over in 1 Corinthians in a different form, but it's the same word. It's called charismatic, charisma, which we talk about the gifts. So basically, John 1.16 is translated, it's gift upon gift. It's God's blessing upon blessing. And then in verse 18, uh, no man has seen God at any time. He's come from the bosom of the Father. Jesus has come from the bosom of the Father to declare him, to make him known. That's why in John 14, when Philip looks at Jesus and says, show us the Father. Now understand, this is not a Trinitarian asking this question. This is a one God Jew. He had been raised with hero Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. When the Jews would say Father, they were not referring <clears throat> to the first person of the Trinity. They were referring to God. Show us God and it sufficeth us. Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, but to us there is only one God who is the father of all. So when the Jews said, show us the father, they're just saying, show us God. We really want to see God. And of course, Jesus' response back to him was, you got to be kidding me. What have I not been so long time with you? Don't you know? When you've seen me, you've seen the father. And so... Jesus has come to declare God. He's come to declare the Father. He's come to make him known. When you seen Jesus Christ, as far as the man is concerned, you were looking at the revelation. You were looking at the mighty God in Christ Jesus. You were looking at the Spirit of God, whether you want to call it the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. There's only one Spirit. And so when you see that, you understand that Jesus Christ had come to reveal him, to make him known. 
Now, John says, uh, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory as of the only begotten. Jesus Christ cannot be eternal because of that one word, begotten. Uh, what was begotten? Well, you, according to the writings of Peter, you are begotten by the word of God. And so what beget him? Well, when uh, the Bible says that um, God spoke to Mary and said that which is going to be in you will be conceived by the Holy Ghost. And uh, the Holy Ghost overshadowed her, but it was by the word of God. And so Jesus Christ, because it's begotten, he is beget, that means that he had a beginning. Amen. Now, I, I ask this question, I ask it to a lot of people, if they're really kind of struggling with uh, how many persons are in the Godhead. Uh, I just, you know, for me, it just kind of has to break down pretty simple. Well, um, who is the father of Jesus Christ, if you believe in that? And they always say, well, the father. And I said, well, that's kind of funny. The Bible says uh, that which was conceived in Mary was of the Holy Ghost. And I said, now, I know some places do things a little different, but the fact is, whoever you are conceived by, that's your daddy. Am I going too far with this? That's your dad. And so that would make the Holy Ghost his father. If you want to complicate it even more than that, go to Isaiah 9 and 6. It says that the son is the everlasting father. Now, Jesus had already said to Philip, he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. So if you really want to get technical about it, who is the father of Jesus Christ? Are you thinking here just a little bit? Who is the father of Jesus Christ? Well, we understand there's one spirit. And so that one spirit, the word, he was begotten by the spirit and he was begotten by the word. And so now here it is, and I'm going to get to it here. Now it says, and we beheld the glory. I want to tell you that the glory of God is when his word is made manifest. And whatever is made manifest, whatever that is, that is God's glory. Now, if you'll remember when Moses said, show us thy glory. And uh, uh, God said, no, nah, Moses, you can't see. Or he said, show us thy glory. And God said, you can't see my face and live. Uh, the reason why, is this too much? The reason why he says that is, is because when he says his face, he's not talking about a physical face, but he's talking about the future. Uh, show me the future. Uh, and he said, you, you can't see the future yet. First of all, the only face that you will ever see of me is in the face of Jesus Christ. He has not been begotten yet. He doesn't exist yet, so I can't show that to you. But I can show you my hinder parts. Now, so some people think that that's just literally the backside of God. So God just turned around and said, here, get a good glimpse. But that's not what it means. Moses, it's attributed to Moses to write the first five books of the Bible. Well, we know that Moses wasn't actually there at creation when it actually happened. But it's apparent that God took him back and he showed him the creation. So what God is showing Moses by showing him his glory or his hinder parts is, here are things that are already created. Here are things that already are manifested. This, is, this has been revealed, so I'm going to show it to you in the se sequential order. So here it is, Moses. And so, again, we find out that when God reveals his glory, it's something that you can see, something that you can touch, something that is tangible. Paul writes to the Romans, and this is really a chapter that we all should be studying, especially in uh, 2021. But Paul writes to the Romans, and he says, if you really want to see the glory of God, then just look at creation. Uh, the things that are revealed by God, even his eternal Godhead, just look at those things. What was revealed of him? Again, we understand that John says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. So uh, now we're back to this. Are you ready for it? We're back to, okay, uh, if you have a thought, then you have to have something to think that thought. That's as far as they would go. But John in his writing said, no, we're going to go a little further. Uh, if you have a thinker, and if that thinker does have that thought, then the thought has to become a thing. It has to become real. It has to become tangible. And so that's where John taught, 
And that's where he brought us to. Amen. Everybody said amen. amen. Now, now we're kind of getting there. Amen. So when you seen Jesus Christ, you were seeing the glory of God revealed, the glory of God made manifest. Now, when Paul again to the Romans, he comes down through there, he uh, specifically starts talking about the glory of God and how that they changed the glory and how that man become the thinker and how that man would have a thought. And once he had that thought and once he could come up with that thought, which he talks about by their minds being darkened by vain imaginations, now everything changes. And now it's not God that is the word. It's man that has the thought. It's man that begins to change the image of things. And it's man that begins to change what you can see. So first of all, Paul says they change the glory. Then about two verses later, he says they change the truth. Well, when you change the truth, because I understand that truth is not just things that we read here, but Jesus Christ really is the revelation of the truth. And so when you talk about they change the truth, now they're not operating by the thought of God. Now they're not operating by the word of God. They have now assumed the position of God. They are the thinker and they're the ones that's going to have the thought. And once they think this and they seek to change what God has created, Paul says that they start uh, imaging these uh, beasts and gold and silver and idols and all this stuff and all. And then he doesn't stop there. He said, but they even sought to change creation. The truth is, and I don't want to offend anybody here, but the truth is that in the beginning, God created male and female. And so that's been what God established. Now, we've come to a time in society that society says we have the right to change the image. We can change creative order. Uh, we have this thought, so we will change it. And so they are not operating by the word of God. They are operating by their own imagination. They're operating by their own thought. That's why that now they're saying that uh, whatever you think you are, that's what you are. Well, that may be what society's saying, but that's not what God said. It'd be okay to say amen. That's not what God said. So they seek to change it. So now you watch this. But the fact is, you're seeing the principle that happens. So you have a thinker. That thinker has a thought. And that thought becomes a thing. We call it creative power. And so now we're back to the creation. At the creation, you have a thinker, he has a thought, God has a thought, and then it starts the creation. It starts him revealing, revealing. You know, if you know anything about creative people, people that have created something, it didn't start, those pews didn't start by just appearing, but somebody had a thought about this. They had the image of this in their mind, but that's the glory of it. This is the finished product of it. The glory of it's not just the person that had the thought, Although in his mind it may be very glorious, but this literally becomes the glory. It becomes the thing that's real about a creator and his thought. Amen. That automobile that you drove to church in or the bus that you took or, or the uh, horse and buggy that you rode in here on. Amen. All of that started over here by somebody having a thought. And that thought ultimately become a thing. And when you see that thing, this is the glory of whoever created it. This is his manifestation. That's why when you beheld Jesus Christ, you were looking at the glory of God. All the way back from creation, God has the thought of Jesus Christ. That's how come Jesus Christ is referred to as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. I don't want to lose you here. Amen. This is where we're at. This is the thing. Now, uh, what you say, well, what in the world has that got to do with us? Well, it's got everything to do with you. Amen. Remember, I also started by talking about maturing and growing. A part of your maturity is to start to understand that what you are ultimately about is not to reveal the glory of man, but you are left here on this earth to reveal the glory of God. So when people see you, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, what do they see? Do they see a lot of the glory of man or do they see the glory of God? 
Uh, this has always been the battle and the exchange. Again, when Jesus has shown the kingdoms of this world and its glory, the devil says, now if you'll just bow and worship me, I'll give this to you. If you will give me the glory of the eternal kingdom, I'll give you the glory of kingdoms of dirt. Well, that's not a good swap. And Jesus even told him, I'm not going to serve you. Uh, I'm not going to bow and worship you. That, that's ridiculous. And so with all of us, this is the battle that we face. The enemy always comes to us and says, uh, will you release the glory of God in exchange for the glory of man? Now, I, I, I'm just probably going too far into this to get to just a real simple point. Amen. Uh, okay, here's the deal. All right. When you obeyed the word of God, when you fleshed out the word of God, that was God's revealed glory. So the more you live in obedience to the word of God, the more glory is manifest through you. I don't know if I believe that. Well, what did Paul tell the Corinthians that he says, uh, and we are changed, what does it say? And we are changed from glory to glory. In other words, you're over here with this weight and dimension of glory, but you're not to stop there. You're to go further and reveal more glory and then go further and reveal more glory and they'll go further and reveal more glory until he says, you know, in the image of Christ. So basically what he's saying is until you become something called glorified. Glorification. Anybody, you understand that one? And so this is the process. And so God says, okay, the only way that you can reveal my glory and go from glory to glory is I will give you the thought. I will give you truth. I will give you my word. And then when you flesh that out. You're revealing more of my glory. And that's what people need to see. That's the battle that we have. Uh, well, I don't know that I want to manifest the glory of God. I would prefer to manifest my glory. I would rather have the thought. I would rather be the thinker. I would rather be the one and then I'll flesh that out. Well, now you've got to decide uh, whose will are you going to live by? Are you going to live by your own will or are you going to live by the will of God? And that's the battle that you face, and that's the battle that we all face. But I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, uh, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So don't, well, living holy and all that's just unreasonable. No, he said it's your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, the, the thoughts that this world has that would form you into what they think, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, how do I prove it? I prove it by living it. I prove it by manifesting it. But it all had to come by the renewing of my mind. Amen. I don't want to be conformed to this world. I would prefer to have my mind renewed. How does that happen? When I take my thoughts and my will and I take it and I say, You're, I'm not going to live by this. You're not going to rule my life. The will of God is going to rule my life. The truth of God is going to rule my life. The thought of God is going to rule my life. I will not become a person of vain imagination. I will not fall into the thing that I have the right to will whatever I want to and that's the life that I will manifest and the life that I would reveal. Well, I'm giving you some good stuff. I hope you understand that right now. That's where we're at. I don't have to do that. Oh, you're right. You don't have to do it. You can live by your own will, argue about it, fuss about it, Google it, try to find every loophole around it that you can find. And you'll find a lie out there. You'll find something that will change the truth. And when they change the truth, then ultimately they change the glory. Mm. Now, Oh, boy. Maybe I should just dismiss this now and go eat. Now, you're set up. Here's the question that I want to ask this church today. Do we want to be a word church or a glory church? 
don't know what you mean. Well, I've just spent, what, 20, 30 minutes telling you what glory is. It's the word made manifest. It's the word when it's revealed and it's fleshed out. So let me simplify this for you today. You ready for it? We can preach about miracles and never see them. We can preach about harvest and revival, but never see it. We can talk from the scripture about God supplying our needs, but it never becoming real. And a lot of churches get excited about that, and so we just kind of learn to focus around what's being preached to us, and just, we're a word church. Well, okay, I'm glad you're a word church, but according to that, God's glory cannot be revealed until his word is made manifest. So we have to decide what we're going to be. Are we going, boy, there's a word that comes to my mind, but it's not a good word to use in a mixed company, amen. Seriously, that would define this pretty clearly. Amen. So we have to decide, do we want the word to produce something? Do we want the seed? I mean, all of you here today were, um, uh, you were begotten by the seed. And I'm trying to be very discreet and word this correctly. Amen. It was seed that you were conceived by. And so the same thing happens to us. When God gives us his word, it's not just something uh, that should not have uh, fruitation to it or shouldn't mature, it shouldn't grow. And so when he gives us his word, then what he does is, is he says, now, uh, this thing, this man, this woman started with seed and then now it's come to being real, something that's tangible, which I believe starts in the womb of a mother. Amen. So this is what happens. And now all of us are sitting here today because we are the manifestation. We are seed that has been revealed. Is this too much? And so it's the same thing with the word of God. God never intended for his word to come into your life and then not produce something and it not to be made manifest. And so when the scripture talks to us about, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory, and I think that encompasses not just financial need, but emotional and spiritual and relational and all that stuff and all. But when we read about those things, we have to define and understand, uh, okay, um, that's the seed, but the seed's not planted, uh, to, to not bear fruit. And so, uh, do we just talk about these things, or are we going to see these things happen? Are we going to hear testimonies about these things happening? Amen. And so, when we talk about people being healed, is it just something that we preach and we feel good about it and we get excited about it? But it's we're not seeing it. It's just something that we constantly are talking about. I got news for you. Uh, I, I I don't want to be uh, just a. Uh, and I got to be careful how I say this. I don't want to just be a word church and just a church of performance and just us talking about Jesus and us talking about the things of God. That's called a synagogue. But I want to be, I want to see it. I want it to be made manifest. If we talk about Acts 2.38, I don't want to just talk about Acts 2.38. I don't want to just talk about the redemption plan. I don't want to just talk about people being born again of the water of the Spirit. I want to see it. I want to see it tangible. I want to see it real. I want to see it made manifest. If I read in my Bible that the glory of the latter house shall be that than the former, I don't want to just get up and quote those verses of Scripture. I want to see the glory of God, and when I see the glory of God, I'm seeing things that are made manifest, things that are tangible, not just things that I read about and things that I talk about. Ooh. Mm. What kind of church do we want to be? Talk about harvest, talk about miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, I'm going to mess with you here in a little bit, so just get ready. Paul made this statement. He said, for I did not come to you with the enticing words of man's wisdom. See, here's what the apostolics have to understand. Okay, first um, we're to be, well, let me put it to you like this. 
If all we have is a Bible and all we have is word, then what separates you from the Quran or any other religious writings? What separates you from that? If out there in the world, you're presenting this and all, and all you have is just uh, scripture, doctrine, then that's where the world is. And if you'll remember, it was, it was Philip that said, show us the Father. This is the same thing that the world is asking now. Show us God. What? Show us the Father. And Jesus said, okay, if you won't believe me for my word's sake, at least believe me for my works. The things that I've made manifest. I'm not just telling you that I'm the Father. I'm not just telling you that in me dwells the Father, God. I'm showing it to you by these works that I'm doing. I'm making it manifest. And so the world out there is saying the same thing to the apostolic church. Show us God. Don't just tell us about God, but show us God. We want to see him. Well, now we're talking about showing them the glory of God. And if you read on down through there, Jesus said that my father might be glorified. In other words, you might show how wonderful he is, how great he is, that you might manifest the spectacular works of God. Now, he's talking about a lot of things there, but he's basically a lot talking about miracles and deliverance and healing and those things. So if you've got a world out there saying, okay, to us, you're no different than any other religion. But if somebody could just show us God, I understand you could still show them God and they still won't believe. But the fact is the question is being asked by many people. Where is God? Well, let me show you what it says in the scripture. And I believe the scripture and I believe that's the seed. And I believe that's where it starts. But it also has to be made manifest. So let me ask some of you a question. Do you believe or not believe in greater works than these shall you do? Then where are they at? Do we believe or not believe? And these signs shall follow them that believe. And he that believeth on me ooh, and is baptized shall be saved. So if you believed on him and you were baptized, then that's, you're supposed to be a believer. Oh, it's locking up right now. No, let me tell you what we do. You ready for it? Not all, but majority. We're content to come to church and just hear preaching about it. And then we start getting picky about what we hear. And then we come to church and we're just kind of bored and just, okay, I've heard all that before. And I wish it at least presented in a different fashion and kind of dress it up and make it more palatable. And, and so we just come to church and we sing about God. We testify about God. We talk about God. We keep it in the four walls of our buildings. Ooh. Don't you think that San Leandro in the Bay Area deserves better than that? But what separates you from the other churches in the city? We're apostolic. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Seven churches in Asia Minor. And the only church pastor that was threatened to have its candlestick removed was Ephesus. Ooh, Ephesus. The only one. You ever studied the church of Ephesus? Have you ever read over there in the book of Revelation what it says about Ephesus? It was the most apostolic church of the seven churches. You can't stand anything that's false. You've not denied my name. You try those that are false. You're true to the doctrine. You're really apostolic. But you left your first love. And because you've left your first love, if you don't repent and return back to it, I'm going to remove your candlestick. It's really quiet in here right now. 
Well, we're Acts 2.38. We're holiness people. We have long hair, long dresses, long sleeves, long tongues. We got it all. And I believe in those things. As a relationship of Jesus Christ, I believe that's a product of my relationship with Jesus. But even with all that, you left your first love. How do we glorify God? How does the world see Jesus? How does the world see God? Well, I told you through signs and wonders. But hang on just a second. Hang on just a second. Hang on. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. All men. Every nation, every generation. It doesn't matter whether it's today or all the way to 221 or 3021. It doesn't matter. By this, all men shall know that you are my disciples. You have love one toward another. Now, in the Greek, uh, that's agape. And it's a verb. Which means you can't say it. You can only do it. You can only manifest it. You can only show it. I'm sorry, but you don't get a refund out of the offering today. I'm, I'm re- <laughs> Send him back across the bridge and give us a refund. Amen. Uh, you know, just here we are just, uh, you know, talking about all this stuff. And we're Acts 238 people and we're separated people and we're one God people. And we got all that down. But I think the best way for us to show the glory of God to the world, especially in our society right now, is by us fleshing out and by us revealing and making it known the love of God and the glory of God. When they don't hear us just talk about loving each other and loving our neighbor. You know, there's two things, and I don't want to get too far into this. But when it talks about love your neighbor, that means people outside your religious system. When it says love your brother, that means people within your religious system. So we're to love our brother and we're to love our neighbor. And how do we manifest him? Well, we don't do it by, um, you know... (laughs) Boy, I'm just really on a row here today. Uh, I wrote down something the other night in service, and I said, uh, I've said this all the time. If you dress the church up and make it try to be appealing to the world, and you make it look like a prostitute to appeal to the eye of man, then we've, we've made the church harlot. The pure shall see God. So we don't have to bring in purity in the church for us to try to say that this is God and reveal God and just performance and through the eye. And I don't know if I'm making sense, but the pure in heart shall see God. And I've always said, if the church is adorned the way it should, and you got over in the book of Revelation, you have the great harlot, and then you've got the bride, the church, and the great harlot, it describes her, how she's decked out. And then it talks about the, the church in fine white linen, in simplicity and purity, but revealing the glory of God, then we have to decide. And I've always used it as an illustration. But the other night, the Lord <laughs> expanded my understanding of that. He said, you're right. He said, you shouldn't dress her up like that. But you shouldn't also dress her up as a cranky old woman. Mean-spirited. Judgmental. Harsh. Sharp with the tongue. Condemning. Ooh. Well, they got quiet. I mean, both ways is wrong. God really intended for the church to manifest his glory or to manifest his works and how benevolent it is. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up here so everybody say, thank you, Jesus. Now, here's the deal. In the Old Testament, they have no currency. So when you read over in the Old Testament that he talks about, he decked Israel out with all these ornaments and then how men would adorn their brides and their wives with all this jewelry and stuff, gold and silver. You have to understand that was the way the man was showing you his wealth, his glory. He couldn't show you his bank account. He couldn't show you his 401k. So what he did is he took all of that and he adorned his bride with it. So when you've seen her, you've seen his wealth. You've seen his glory. And so God says to the church, no, 
I don't want you to be adorned with the glory of this world. I want to adorn you with what I consider to be my true riches. And I want to reveal through you my glory to the world. I, I, I'm afraid I missed with some of you here today. I, I hope that this is, I'm not just trying to entertain you or perform for you here today. I'm telling you something that the Holy Ghost has very strongly been revealing and talking to me about. If we're not careful apostolics, we, we fail to understand those things. And then church just really becomes a time of entertainment for us. We just come and they become performers. The preacher becomes a performer and the praise team becomes performers and all the stuff. And so we just come to church and we just, you know, okay, entertain us, you know. Okay, you got an uh, hour and a half, two hours, and uh, let's, let's get in here and get this thing over with. Let's talk about Jesus here a little bit. And, uh, you know, then I'm going to go home and live my life and I'm going to be a good godly person and that's it's just kind of the way that we've kind of thought about things. But God says, no, I didn't leave you in the world to, to you just to get isolated. I put you in the world to reveal my glory. I want to adorn you with my wealth and my glory. I want to glorify myself through you. And so I'm asking the church, don't just read about these things. Don't just become a performance oriented church. You know, there, I'm going to just be honest with you. I, now this is just me. But boy, when we go for a while and we haven't baptized somebody, I, I, I start like, okay, something's off somewhere, something's wrong. And we can get locked in to just, you know, that's just the way it is. You know, uh, people just don't want to know about God anymore and they don't want Acts 2.38. I, I, I don't believe that. If that's the case, then what are we still doing here? I, 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 it starts bothering me when we go a while, we haven't had somebody get the Holy Ghost. And then when the gifts of the Spirit are not operating among us, it bothers me. Oh, boy. There are the gifts of the Spirit. How do you think you get from Logos to glory? It's by grace, and grace is a gift. You, God can speak to you over here and put his thought in your mind, but for you to get to where it's thought, prophecy or whatever, to, for it to become reality, guess what you got to do? You got to allow the gifts to operate, the gifts that come from God. The only way you can get from it just being in your brain to you over here where it's really real is, you can't get there by yourself. You need the gift of faith to operate. And how does the church get from it just being a thought to becoming a reality? Well, there's the gifts of the Spirit. There's other gifts that are involved in the church. Why is it that we're, oh boy, I could tell you right now, in the Holy Ghost, a lot of you are strangers to the gifts. We're content by having church without the gifts of the Spirit operating. How in the world can you build what God wants you to build without tools? Well, we got our doctrine right. Really. Really. You sure about that? There's a whole lot more about that Bible than just Acts 2.38 and you dressing up. I got a spirit cornered here right now. Where is the gifts of the spirit? Where is the demonstration of the spirit? I'm not talking about the demonstration of a worship service. I'm talking about the demonstration of the power. I'm talking about the glory of God made manifest. I'm talking about devils being cast out. I guess all the devils disappeared. There's no more devils left in the world anymore because our churches, we don't hardly ever see devils being cast out anymore. And let me tell you where Jesus found more devils than anywhere else. In the church. The synagogues. Boy, I have messed this service up, and I'm telling you, some of you want to fire me and get a refund, but I already told you, according to the IRS, once you give the offering, you can't get it back. It's called money laundering. Where are they at? Well, we, we just want Pastor Pritt to come in here, and I want the praise team to stir us up a little bit. We're going to sing about Jesus and feel his presence, and that's, you know, ooh. I feel Jesus. Well, we should feel Jesus. We're talking about him. But where is the glory? Where are the people being delivered? You don't think that somewhere in San Leandro in this area of the Bay Area, there's not somebody crying out right now? 
I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I, I, I need some hope. I need some help right now. You don't think there's people around here like that? But if all we do is just come to church and this is it, and we don't have a hunger for the glory of God. So they were singing a while ago, show us thy glory. Well, if that's really coming from our hearts and it's not just words, what we're saying is, okay, God, we want to see people saved and delivered, and we want to see the miraculous power of God, and we want to see the provisions of God. That's what we want to see. Show us thy glory. Let's pray here a second. Lift your voice in your hands right now. Mm. Mm. Oh, let's do a little bit better than that. I mean, really cry out to God here a second. thy glory show us thy glory show us thy glory Ooh. show us thy glory I was uh Phil, tell the story. I was an old Mulgee pastoring. And uh, we had prayer meeting on Saturday nights, church prayer meeting. And uh, we're down there praying and somebody come up on, I was praying on the platform, somebody come up there and they said, uh, Brother Morgan. And I said, yeah. He said, Linda Salyer's here. I said, who? Linda Salyer. Who's that? Probably one of the meanest women in town. Drug dealer. She got somebody stole something from her, so she got to a four-way stop. Linda didn't get out just to talk about it. Linda got out and started firing bullets. Linda sold her daughter into prostitution when she was about 12 or 13 to support her habits. Linda had been married and lived with I don't know who. She had sold drugs, took drugs. I mean, it was, she was a mess. So there she's standing in our altar that night, hard, hard. I mean, just her features were hard. Just. So I went down there and prayed for her. And uh, I mean, it, I'd probably have better results praying for that pew. And I prayed for her, and she just real defiant. Just real defiant, just hard, just resistant. And uh, pray a little bit. She don't want anything. So it's Saturday night. I got to get ready for Sunday. I prayed a while, so I slipped back into my office, and I'm sitting there behind the desk doing my pastoral duty preparing for the bias back when we had Bible studies from 10 to 11 and then morning worship from 11 to 12. And so I'm back there preparing for the Bible study and my sermon as a good pastor, you know, getting fresh bread. And I barely just got set down and cracked my Bible open when I heard these words. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there not a physician where a physician should dwell? What? Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician in the house? Okay, God, help me with what you're trying to say. If that woman can't find hope and deliverance in the church, where is she going to find it? Now, you get out from this desk, quit preparing a sermon to entertain a bunch of spoiled Pentecostals, and you go out there and you pray the prayer of deliverance over her. I get up, my old office used to be kind of back over in that area, and I come out across the platform, and she's still standing there, and now it's a little different story. 
Now the word was about to be made flesh. And when I come across that platform, it wasn't Linda that started crying out. It was the demons that were in her that started crying out. Get away from us. Leave us alone. Now the whole situation has changed. Now I understood. You know what, God, you put this church in this community for there to be bomb in Gilead and for there to be a physician in the house. And when there's no bomb in Gilead and there's no physician in the house, then what are we here for? I'm not trying to be mean to you, but I just kind of sense a good, oh, I'm contented. That, that's not going to work. That's not going to get it done. You've got millions of people out here in the Bay Area that need the Holy Ghost and need some kind of hope and the bomb of Gilead, and it's got to be in the church. <laughs> Brother, I don't know how many devils we cast out of her that night. And I'll tell you, Linda become a project. I mean, she literally become a project. Thank God for projects. You didn't come to God fully mature either. And I mean, she'd do good for a while and then she'd have a little reset. But she kept getting back up. And I remember one time she, she kind of flipped out a little bit and got out and overdosed. And somebody shot her up with a bunch of junk she wouldn't. And, and they, she, it looked like she had died. And they dumped her over in a bathtub. And, and everybody left the party. Somebody called her daughter who had just got out of prison, somebody called her daughter and told her, we left your mom over here. So they got over there and had to call the paramedics. And so they took her to the hospital and all the stuff. And then, but since the next service, here she come. <laughs> she come, I mean, running up to me. And I can remember her falling at my feet and wrapping her arms around my ankles. And she said, begging me, looking up with tears. She's not begging me, please, whatever you do, don't let me go back to that place. I said, Linda, what are you talking about? She said, call it the episode. When I had the episode the other night, she said, all I know is I went into a place of darkness that you cannot explain. And I also knew that I'd entered a place that was totally void of God. God was not there. And she said, Brother Morgan, I'm begging you, whatever you got to do, make sure that I don't go back to that place. I don't want to go back to that place. The thoughts of going back to that place is unbearable. I'm asking you tonight, Brother Morgan, pr please pray again. I'm telling you, there has to be bomb in Gilead. There has to be a physician in the house. We got to do more than just entertain, and we got to do more than just perform, and we got to do more than just talk about these things. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost that God wants to send a revival to this congregation and a harvest to it but it's going listen to me it's going to come when you say show us thy glory we, we we're thank you for your presence thank you for every time you show up here jesus on a sunday thank you for every time we feel your spirit thank you for every time i get goosebumps and i get excited about it but i'm not content with just your presence i'm not content content just to hear the scripture i want to see your glory i want to see you made manifest i want to see these things happen i want to see these pews filled with people receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I want to see the crackheads. I want to see the meth addicts. I want to see the prostitutes. I want to see the, the, the perverted. I want to see all of them. I want to see them delivered and saved. I want to see the, those that are down and those that are up. I want to see them saved. I want to see the glory of God. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. They're still saying, show us the Father. Show us the Father. And San Leandro today... I'll speak for them. What's the name of the new life? You know what they're saying? New life! New life! Show us the Father. Show us God. Show us. Don't just tell us. Show us the Father. Woo. That's what these revival services are going to be about. It's going to be about stirring you up and moving you to the place that you start hearing that. That ought to haunt you. That ought to haunt you every time you get down to pray. You ought to hear the echoing of that every time you get out, every time you come to the house of God, every time you gather together in fellowship. That ought to be somewhere back in your mind. Show us the Father. Show us the Father. Show us God. Every time you walk in a restaurant, you need to hear that. Show us God. 
Next time the Spirit of the Lord moves on you to pray for somebody, you ought to hear the cry. What really is the cry is, show us God. Well, I, I'll get you down to the church and, and I'll have the preacher pray for you. And if you can come on a Sunday morning, no, 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 no. These signs shall follow them that believe. There's thousands of people here in San Leandro, the Bay Area, that's crying out right now. Show us God. I need a miracle. I need deliverance. I need a healing. I need salvation. Show us. Where's it at? Don't just tell me about it. Show it to me. Let me see it. Let me experience it. Somebody ought to praise him here just for a second right now. Woo. Don't let him pray by himself that kind of a prayer. Some of you need to be joining with him right now. You need to open your mouth and fervently start praying in the Holy Ghost right now because the Spirit of God's challenging this church. You to, I want you to hear me, and I'm, I'm, when, I, when I do this, I'm going to put the microphone down, and I'm done. I have preached a lot of services like this in my ministry. I have seen churches come to a moment where they have to make a decision. They have to make a decision. Uh, churches have to come to the moment that they decide which throne is going to rule in this church. Years ago, I was preaching for David Shatwell in Okima. He, had, he hadn't been there just a few weeks, a few months, and I was preaching for him. And uh, we was in kind of a service like this, altar service and all, and I was on the platform, and when I turned and looked across that, uh, that uh, congregation, all of a sudden the whole room went dark. And right in the center of the congregation, I seen an old throne. And there was something very hideous that was sitting on it. And you could get a sense of all this kind of creepy, crawly stuff around it. And then I seen it start to crack. And it was just starting to disintegrate. And the Holy Ghost spoke in the vision and said, I'm going to destroy the throne of iniquity in this church. And I will establish my throne of righteousness. And uh, anytime God shows me something that I feel like he does, I always want to substantiate it by the word of God. So I went back and looked up. And sure enough, I think it's in one of the Old Testament chapters or books. It talks about the throne of iniquity. And uh, then there's one that talks about the throne of righteousness. And congregations have to decide. Now, this is what God began to show me. It's not, it is not... The preacher that decides that. It's the congregation that decides that. When Moses come down off the mountain. Now understand the preaching's over. The entertaining's over. I'm talking to you in the Holy Ghost right now. When Moses comes off the mountain three times he told those people about the law. And three times they said we will hearken and we will obey. And at the third part of it, Moses and the 70 elders were allowed to see the glory of God made manifest in the heavens. But this is after the people said, we will agree and we will obey. It is in the power of this congregation to decide what is going to rule this congregation. What way the path that this congregation goes. 
Iniquity is lawlessness. It's where you rule. The throne of righteousness is where God rules. And so churches have to come to a moment that they decide, are we going to obey the word of God and go on and see the glory of God, or are we going to let iniquity, self-rule, we're going to let it take over in the church, which becomes Laodicea. You understand what I'm saying? It becomes a Laodicean church. <clears throat> this is where we're at, and this is what we have to decide. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, I've been in other services just like this, <clears throat> that this church has a decision to make today. They can't make it for you. You're going to have to make it. And you need to make sure that you make the right decision. Because if you don't make the right decision, uh, you'll just kind of keep floating along and the things that God had prepared for you, um, you'll miss them. The promised land you'll miss because you came to Kadesh Barnea and you looked at your promise and said, we can't do it. Too many things to overcome, we can't do it. So today this church stands on a threshold. And uh, there's a lot that's going to be determined by this service today. So I would suggest that you really get kind of interested in what I'm saying right now and that you understand the consequence of your decision. That this church needs to make its mind up that we're going to be a real apostolic church. That we are going to see the glory of God made manifest. We're not just going to talk about it, but we're going to answer the response to the community that we're going to reveal to them God. And we're not just going to be a good old UPC church where we just come together and just go through the Pentecostal calisthenics, but we're going to be an apostolic church. So today, you have a decision to make. And today, you need to understand the seriousness of that decision. Now, I'm not expecting you to run, jump, shout, talk in tongues. I mean, that may come. But I am expecting you in your mind and in your will to determine Whose will is going to rule this church? Will it be the will of the people or will it be the will of God? I suggest that you get your mind renewed right now and not be conformed to whatever it is that's in your mind, how this church, I feel the Holy Ghost real strong right now. You see, some of you, you've already got it in your mind how you think this church ought to be conformed. And the Holy Ghost saying, you need your mind renewed. Well, we want to keep it safe and we want to keep it pure. You need your mind renews what you need, and uh, you need to find the will of God. And that's only going to come when you die out. And Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. He died the night before in the garden when he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nonetheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So this church is in its garden of Gethsemane, and it's going to make a decision tonight. We're either going to conform to what we think we ought to do and how we think it ought to happen or we're going to get our minds renewed and we're going to do the will of God and not our own will and that means that you're going to have to become fervent about revival you're going to have to become fervent about the things of God that means you're going to have to be very passionate about showing the world its glory that means when you come to the house of God I'm not here to be entertained I'm here to worship and to praise and to be a conduit of the blessing of God flowing from me because out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water there ought to be something flowing from you through the service that's ministering to everybody in your proximity Okay, let's stand. Bow your heads. And I want you to think what I just mentioned in the last five minutes. Think about it. Well, this is the way we've always done it, Brother Morgan. This is the way that I was raised. And this is the way this, this, and this, and this, and this. Well, I just want to know, is it working? You've got a city out here saying, show us the Father. And you've got, to, you've got to ask yourself the question, is this working? Is this happening? What kind of church do we want to be? We want to be a performance church or we want to be a glory church? We just want to be a church that talks about it or we want to be a church that sees it? What kind of church do we want to be? Because you're going to have to, that's the decision that you're going to have to make. If people don't have a hunger, listen to me. God is not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of hunger. So that means that God won't exempt you because of who you are. But you not having a hunger for the things of God, you'll exempt yourself from it. 
So you know what? What are you hungry for? Are you hungry to really see the glory? Show us thy glory. Now you understand what that really means. Are you hungry for that? Or what, what, what are we hungry here for today? That's, that's what we got to decide. And so I'm going to give you just a few seconds here. It's not going to take long. I'm going to give you just a few seconds here to contemplate and to think, okay, I, we got to make the right decision here today. And uh, we got to, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means I got I to gotta die out here right now. I got to die out to my thought, my ways, my will. I got to die out to it right now, what I think ought to happen. And I'm, I'm going to die out and I'm going to let God renew my mind here today. That happens if I die out. I'll let him renew my mind that I won't be conformed to self-will, but I'll be conformed to the will of God, and I'll go prove it. I'll go show it. So just in a few seconds, your response to God is going to indicate to him the decision that you made, the decision that you made, that you made for your family, that you made for your life, that you made for your kids, your children, your grandchildren. You need to make a decision here today. And I'm challenging you with apostolic authority in this place. I'm challenging you right now. Make the right decision. San Leandro needs you to make the right decision. The Bay Area needs you to make the right decision. There's people in this service today that need you to make the right decision decision. So I'm, I'm willing to let my comfort die. I'm willing to let my ease die. I'm willing to let my spiritual uh, being lax die. And I want, I want to become fervent about the things of God. And I know some of you are struggling. Well, I've been there before and nothing happened. We'll try it one more time. One more time, one more time, one more time. We're going to make a decision here. We're getting close to that decision being made. And I, I can see the Holy Ghost moving on some of you right now. I can see his spirit. You know what that's telling me right now? It's telling me that in your heart, you're already making that decision right now. By the Holy Ghost moving on you. That's him bearing witness of you right now. You're making the right decision. You're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. I think this church will make the right decision. I think you will do the right thing. I think you will answer to the call. I think you will answer to the hunger that's outside. I think you will. I feel the Holy Ghost right now bearing witness of you in your heart saying, we want the throne of righteousness. We want God to rule in this church. We want the will of God to be prevalent here in this church. Now, if that's in you and that's the decision that you make and it's going to have to come from your heart, I'm going to submit my life, I'm going to submit my will to the will of God. If that's you, I want you to lift your voice and I want you to let the tone of your voice depict the hunger that's within you to be conformed not to this world, but rather to be transformed by the renewing of your mind for the Holy Ghost to work through you right now and for the Holy Ghost to make manifest through you the glory glory of God come on I feel the Holy Ghost right now that's it cry out to the Lord right now new life cry out to the Lord right now I want the will of God to be done in my life and in my church Woo. Now, if you're with your family or if you're with somebody, you feel comfortable doing this. I understand all the stuff that's going on, but if you feel comfortable and you're okay to do this, I want you to connect with somebody close to you, and I want you to pray as a body of believers. You prayed individually. Now pray as a family, not only your immediate biological family, but pray as the family of God. Let us join together in making this decision. Let us join together in affirming to God this is the kind of church. We want to be an apostolic church. We want to be a book of Acts church. We're not just interested in being a good old UPC church. We want to be a book of Acts church. We want to be a church that's full of the power, the glory, and the love of God. In the name of Jesus.
takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.